after first after Sunday school then? No, I'll go get the mail and then come back. I'll come back. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much. Welcome this morning. It's good to have you in the Lord's house. And we're going to begin our service this morning with a video in honor of those who have served and are serving. And so we'll begin our service. this morning to recognize those who are currently serving in our military. If that's you, will you please stand? I was looking at you, Miss Pam. Are you retired? You retired? After how many years? All right. Well, let's give Miss Pam a round of applause. In addition to these, I would like to ask those whose fathers, grandfathers, sons, daughters, others in your family have served, if you will join these in standing. Look at this. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for those who have been willing in days gone by to put themselves at risk, to put themselves away from home, away from family and friends, to serve our nation. And in this day when our nation seems to be in so much harm, I pray that you'll protect those who are currently serving. 
thank you for those who are um, being honored by our standing today. Those who, many of whom have long since passed on. We pray your blessings on their families. We pray, Lord, that you would look upon our nation with mercy and grace. For it's in Jesus' name. I'll never forget the first time I went to Normandy, France, and I went to the memorial there, and I walked across that perfectly manicured grass, and I looked at the thousands and thousands of white crosses that stretched across that field. And it hit me for the first time that day. The cross has become a symbol of the sacrifice of one another and in most cultures on this earth when you see a white cross it symbolizes the sacrifice that someone has laid down their lives for another and you see it in military graveyards around the world that one especially Do you know that's true here too on Memorial Day as we remember you watched it in the video today we're going to sing about the cross in honor of the sacrifice that gave us all hope and gave us all salvation. And that's Christ's sacrifice. So join me this morning. We'll start with number 241, Jesus Paid It All. Let's stand together as we sing. I hear the Savior say, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. If you would turn over two pages as we sing Wounded for Me. This is not one we sing a lot. It's not a difficult song. And notice the words as we sing together. Wounded for me, wounded for me, there on the cross he was wounded for me, gone by transgressions and now I am free, all because Jesus was wounded for me. Dying
stay dead, did he? Risen for me, risen for me. Up from the grave, he is risen for me. Now evermore from death sting I am free. All because Jesus has risen.
God's word from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 29 through 31. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk. Let's stand once again as we sing the wonderful cross. course one more time. This morning I'm going to sing a song that's probably pretty familiar, but it goes right along with what we have been singing. It's a hill called Mount Calvary. Never 
be held in our hand. And I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I'll believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered, no more I'll still cling to the old rugged cross I believe that the Christ who was slain on that cross has the power to change lives today for he changed me completely a new life is mine and that is why at the cross I will stay and I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary and I'll believe whatever When time has surrendered and earth is no more, will I still cling to the old rugged cross? I believe that this life with its great mysteries surely someday will come to an end, but faith will conquer the darkness and death, and will lead me at last to my friend, and I believe in a hill Sing that chorus. Only half of you are singing it anyway. Let's sing that chorus together. I believe in a... Listen. 
I've been dreading it all week. I'm talking about waiting, and I had to make you wait for just a minute, and I've been nervous about it the whole time, especially I wanted to say so much about what Dad just said, but uh, I, had to, I had to pause a minute, and it's hard for me. Usually I like talking on my way up here, you know, but uh, I, I wanted to give a little object lesson, and it fell apart because I didn't turn my microphone on either, but uh, that was a lot of problems with that. But today we are going to talk about waiting. I would rather have a tooth pulled than for someone to say, we're going to have someone there between 10 and 2. Don't you hate that? Uh, in January, I ordered some chairs for Children's Church, and they finally were ready last month. So I'd already waited like that. And then the place sent me a message and said, we need someone there to accept delivery, and it's going to be Tuesday. You just have to be there Tuesday. And I almost said, you know, our kids can sit in the floor. Just keep the chairs. I, don't, I, I can't deal with this. I do not like to wait. I don't like it. And waiting is the worst. It, it's changed over the past few years, too. Now, uh, if, if I said, guys, I forgot my Bible, I need to run to my car. If I went down there to get my Bible and came back, nine out of ten of you would be scrolling, you know? That's the way we wait these days. Uh, in the Walmart checkout line, uh, some people, even between commercials, they're on their phones. Uh, maybe some of you lawbreakers even at a traffic light are having to catch up on a little Instagram or something. Uh, we're not good at waiting anymore, if we ever were. But that wouldn't be a big deal if the Bible didn't tell us that it's our job to wait on the Lord. I want you to turn to Psalm 27, if you don't mind. We're going to read from there about waiting for the Lord. Psalm 27 is an incredible chapter. If you're ever in a struggle, it's a good place to read. The verses in there that uh, my dad always quotes to me uh, that says, when my mother and father have forsaken me, then the Lord will, will take me in. He doesn't think that my mother and father are going to forsake me anytime soon, but uh, the Lord will take me in at that point. But we're going to read Psalm 27, 14. This is what the Bible says. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. It says it twice there. When I see the phrase, wait for the Lord, I immediately think of checking my watch, tapping my foot, and waiting on the Lord to answer some prayer that I prayed to him, but that's not what this is talking about. Waiting for the Lord here is patiently watching with expectation. It's looking toward him and his word for answers and direction. Now that's, that's my definition of waiting for the Lord. I'm going to take two or three different swipes at it today, defining it. Uh, but that's my first official definition of waiting for the Lord. It's patiently watching with expectation, looking toward him and his word uh, for answers, and then going in that direction. Uh, it's not foot tapping. It's not, when are you going to answer this prayer, Lord? It's more like the other way we use the word wait, you know? Uh, we need to be good waiters. Just like if you think about maybe going to Rafferty's. You guys ever go to Rafferty's? Uh, and you have that person that comes to the table, takes your order, and uh, they're ready for instruction. They're ready to help you. That's what a waiter does. Uh, they will bring you that hot honey mustard and bacon dressing. Have you ever had that stuff? If you haven't, let's pause now and take a little trip. What time does Rafferty's open again? This is the first service. We'll continue on. But that's the kind of waiter that we need to be, a, a waiter who is fully focused and not distracted. Uh, David wrote Psalm 27, and he was a shepherd. Imagine being a shepherd and what, what that job would allow you to do. There was plenty of time to wait quietly on the Lord. I can just visualize David leaning up against the tree, uh, thinking about God's word and letting it sink into his heart and putting his mind on him. And David actually uh, heard from the Lord. That's not what we have. We're, we're not sitting around like David waiting for new revelation. We have God's word. But it's the same thing for us. But taking God's word and wrapping our mind around it and then letting it change us. That's what waiting for the Lord is. Waiting for the Lord is also letting God know what we think is important. Time is our greatest commodity. You know what I mean? If you spend some time with a person, it really lets them know what they mean to you. Your kids know this, by the way. I remember when I was little, uh, we would eat supper. Dad would uh, be home there. Sometimes he would cook supper. Mom was teaching school. It was, a, it was a weird schedule, but 
all the time dad would leave again he would go uh, to see people or visit or study or do all kinds of different things and it, but he would sit down and after supper kind of put his feet up and I can remember going over and untying his shoes and doing my best to pull his shoes off of him because I knew when the shoes came off he was probably going to be home and I remember him being slightly annoyed by me always undoing shoestrings and thinking, what are you doing? But it was because I wanted his time. And I didn't even mind him being a little annoyed at me for that uh, because I wanted that time with Dad. And giving our time to God lets him know how we feel about him too. What a tragedy it would have been if David had been catching up on TikTok out in the field instead of waiting on the Lord. The quiet shepherding days are gone though. We, we don't have that. It's just history. There's no sitting leaned up against a tree somewhere being a shepherd. We've lost all the margin in our lives. You know that little extra time where you're not doing anything? We feel every moment. If you need evidence of this, uh, let me point you to the fact that we can listen to a podcast. We can have people talk to us constantly, and you can speed that up to double speed. It's not enough that we can have people tell us stories constantly. We don't even want them to take a breath. We feel every moment. There's this anecdotal thought that uh, we do our best thinking in the shower. I don't know, do you feel that way? I think it's probably because that's where we escape our phones and our TVs and our books or whatever else is a distraction, whatever your favorite distraction is. Waiting on the Lord is setting aside everything but his word to focus on him. That's what waiting on the Lord is. Let's listen again to what David wrote there in Psalm 27, 14. It says this, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. It is a wait for the Lord sandwich, if you will, with be strong and let your heart take courage in the middle. There's strength and courage to be had when we take time to think on the Lord's goodness. I don't know about y'all, but strength and courage are two things that I could use more of in my life. Let me show you how this works. This is another one of my runs at trying to explain uh, what this waiting on the Lord is. Uh, every year at the end of the school year, West Cheatham Elementary has a fun day to reward kids for reading and um, I don't know what all it's for. It seems like every kid almost gets to come. So it's, it feels like a party day for the teachers if I'm honest about it. Uh, I love this school. I love these people. Most of you work there as I look out there and see. If you don't know about West Cheatham, it is Bethel uh, South or whatever direction that is. It is a beautiful place of wonderful people taking care of kids. I just love it so much. And on this day, I get to go into the school and my job in that fun time is to make balloon animals. Uh, it's, you know, not everybody can do that kind of difficult work that I do as a youth pastor. I, uh, I, I look forward to it every year. It's, it's so fun to have the kids there go to our church and three-fourths of the workers there come here to Bethel, and I love it. And it was the same this week. It was, it was so much fun. But at the same moment, we were there enjoying our Tuesday, making balloon animals, as silly as that sounds. There was unbelievable tragedy happening at an elementary school in Texas at the same time. And you... Did you see those parents' faces as uh, they were waiting on their kids? They were trying to pick their kids up from school, not knowing whether they were safe or not. You could feel the pain on these parents' faces. Even the ones who didn't lose their child. They, uh, the thought of that loss caused me to wait on the Lord. I, I started thinking, uh, God knew how painful sin and death was going to be before he made us. He knew that. And he wasn't lonely, he wasn't incomplete in any way, and still he made us knowing the horror that sin would bring. You know what I mean? He, he knew that these parents were going to face this. He knew that we were going to face all kinds of difficult things. Is the gift of our existence worth that kind of pain? And it made me start thinking. And the thought of that drove me to the Bible. And I read Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and I read the creation story, and I read how he created Adam in his image. He created everything, and it was good. But then he created man in his image, and he said that was very good. And the reason he created Adam was, I, some of you guys can tell me, because I've taught this for like three weeks. 
with the students. And they know this, especially my youth service guys and girls. But the reason we were made, our purpose is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. Did you know that's why you were made? That's why Adam was made in the first place? So that he could enjoy God and bring Him glory uh, by enjoying Him. That was his job. But for man to enjoy God like that, he had to have a choice, whether to love God or not love God. So God put the tree in the middle of the garden. And, uh, man rebelled and sin came into the world. Love is a choice and man chose sin. Adam blew it, as we all have. But that's where all this sin and pain and death comes from. And when we see the brokenness in this world, in things like war and in uh, school shootings and violence against children, we can be tempted to kind of shake our fist at God and say, how could you put us through this? That's the way I kind of felt. That's what drove me to this. How do, I, I can't imagine the pain that these parents are going through. Why even make mankind in the first place thinking about this kind of pain? But the thing is, God did not create us and then watch from a distance. He didn't cross his arms and say, well, looky there. He reached deep into our filth with his absolute best. He sent his perfect son to tackle sin and death and to suffer like no one else could. He suffered worse than any of these tragedies that we see. And he beat death so we could too. And as I thought about this, I thought about what kind of incredible love is at the heart of this story. It's beautiful. And as I thought about these things, it gave me strength. Just like uh, David said in Psalm 27, it gave me strength. But I'll tell you something. I can't think through this kind of thing while I'm solving a wordle at the same time. You have to pause, you have to set aside a time to spend with the Lord, to focus on this kind of thing. This requires waiting on the Lord. Shallow thinking leads to shallow thoughts. Uh, our thoughts kind of go through a life cycle, you know? We read God's word, we have a thought, the thought is born, we scrutinize it a little bit, and we watch it expand and grow, and it solidifies, and then it governs our lives. And that, that takes time. But if we read a verse kind of the way I used to read verses at my grandpa's house, uh, they never have time to get out of diapers. I don't know if your grandpa had this, but my grandpa used to have this little plastic loaf of bread that sat on the table, had a little rectangle cut out of the middle of it, and had all these cards with Bible verses on it, different colored cards. Did anybody else have a, a or maybe you have some in your house? Yes. This little, it, it's, it's our daily bread, and it, it looked like a little tiny loaf of bread. And I would pull those verses out of there and read it real fast and stick it back in, grab another one, like I'm reading a fortune cookie or something. And um, I, I, I love to do that, and also love thinking about how delicious that little loaf of bread would be if it were real, because it looked so good, and it was just the right size. But that's not what waiting on the Lord is. Waiting on the Lord is diving into his word, blocking out everything else, to focus on him. It's really similar to the way Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. Wouldn't that be beautiful? My yard has so much moss in it. The Lee boys mow it. It's, they know how it is. I've got nine blades of grass and they take care of them like crazy. But I love going out there when it's cool and walking on that moss. It just, it's so nice. I can't imagine what it must have been like to take time to walk with God in the cool of the day. Like I mentioned earlier, David wrote Psalm 27 and the whole chapter centers around him seeking the Lord. But David didn't do that 100% of the time. He did not bat a thousand. In 1 Samuel 11, David had some time on his hands. A time that he could have used waiting on the Lord, but he did not. Listen to this really quickly. This is 1 Samuel 11, uh, verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when king go, kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on his roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. There's no doubt that this rooftop was a place where David spent time waiting with the Lord. But on this day, when he should have been at war, David got up from a late afternoon nap and noticed what was a terribly inappropriate situation and he embraced it. If you don't wait for the Lord, Satan's waiting on you like a roaring lion, waiting to devour you. How different would David's life have been if he would have woken up from that afternoon nap? Listen, I've got nothing wrong with an afternoon nap. I am down. You might get to witness one today if you came by my house. 
Afternoon naps are the best. There's nothing wrong with that. But he walked over to the edge of his roof and he saw Bathsheba. What if he would have said, you know what? I'm going to go spend some time with the Lord. And also somebody order that lady some curtains, if you don't mind. Uh, but this was obviously a weak time for David. It was a time of weakness. He should have been off at war. And here he is taking a nap on the roof of his house, getting up from a difficult nap to walk around on the roof and be tempted. It's terrible. It was a time of weakness for him. We live in an exhausting world. And I think waiting on the Lord is the key to finding strength for the day. Psalm 27 said it. And there's another passage uh, that Brother Tim read earlier that talks about the Lord giving us strength by waiting as well. It's Isaiah chapter 40. And I'm, I want to read those verses that he read, verses 29 through 31. This is what it says. It's very familiar. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's a beautiful passage that's quoted often. And I hope that you look at it a little differently than you did when we started. Uh, it says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I've taught this in the past, and I've, I've taught this saying, this kind of reminds me of the Christian life. You know, some days you're flying like an eagle. Some days you're running, and some days you're walking, but you're never going to faint. The Lord's with you. And while that's true, I don't think this is talking, that this is not what's at the heart of this verse. At the heart of this verse, the emphasis is those who wait on the Lord. Their strength is renewed. They mount up with wings like eagles. They, they run and they're not weary. They walk and they're not faint. Uh, the thing is this, my friends, every day you get 24 hours. No more, but no less. You get to use those hours however you choose. You won't accidentally wait on the Lord. When I was thinking about preaching on this, uh, I thought about how last week dad preached and called down fire from heaven and uh, preached against sin and was uh, it was so wonderful. And here I'm talking about waiting on the Lord. You know, it's not exactly sinners in the hands of an angry God, what I'm talking about today. But I do want to tell you something. This is the biggest struggle of my life, setting aside time to wait on the Lord. It's difficult. It's difficult to grab these moments and not be distracted by other less important things. I don't like silence. I find it hard to sit still and focus. Waiting for the Lord seems so basic, but it's such a fight. And it's not just for me. We looked at how David struggled with it, and it, it seems to me that it was easier for David to fight a giant than it was for him to set aside time to be with the Lord. And I gotta tell you the truth. Sometimes I'd rather fist fight somebody then set aside a time, I get so distracted. I, even coming in here and trying to be at this altar by myself, I get distracted even in this room in complete quiet. It's difficult. But out of the 1,440 minutes that you have today, which of them are you going to set aside for this? I know that most of our time today has been focused toward people who are believers. I know a lot of us here are believers, and that's, that's wonderful. And uh, I, I hope it's a help to you, but obviously if you're unsaved, you wouldn't need to wait for the Lord um, in the same way that I'm talking about here. But I'd like to spend just these last few minutes uh, talking to my friends here today who might not put their faith in Christ as your hope for salvation. For the same reasons that 2022 is a tough time to wait on the Lord, this is a dangerous time not to be saved. What I'm saying is there are distractions around every corner. You can live such a crowded life that you don't ever have to pause to contemplate the big questions of life, like where did I come from, uh, why am I here, or where am I going? It's, it's absolutely possible to live from one distraction to the next until you go to sleep with your TV on and wake up the next day uh, with it ready to greet you. If you're not careful, you can do this for an entire lifetime. But right now, is one of those moments when you have to do something with Jesus. Toss aside all the distractions and you're making a decision right now. One day you and I will die and we'll spend eternity in heaven or hell. There are so many ways to miss heaven. 
I mean, you can be a rotten criminal or you can be a delightful humanitarian. Either one of those work. All roads lead to eternal separation from God except for one. The one and only road to salvation is through Jesus. He loved us. He came to show us how to live. And he was tortured and crucified. The Bible says he became sin. The sinless one became sin and suffered absolutely for it. But I'm so thankful to report that Jesus is God. And sin and death's victory was so temporary. Jesus defeated the grave. And because of that, you and I can have that same victory through him. Believe that Jesus suffered, died, and rose again. Put your faith in him and put him in charge of your life. Ask for forgiveness, confessing that he is your only hope for time and eternity. And he will save you. You can do that in just a minute. But let me finish with this. The two passages we read are really clear about the effects of not waiting on the Lord. Weakness and fear are present where waiting is not. And I, I, I don't know if you know it or not, but there are some exciting things going on around here. There are some people who, are, uh, who have a new uh, sense of how God is working and how we should be witnesses and brokenness for our neighbors. And it's a wonderful thing. I love all that. But the Lord will, will never bless us more deeply than we go with him. I hope that you today will make up your mind that you are going to set aside a time to wait for the Lord and to let his word change you. And if, you, if he puts his finger on something in your life that you need to change, even if he's doing that right now, I hope you'll do that. But especially if you've never accepted Christ. I hope that you'll set aside every distraction today and come in just a moment when we have an invitation. We would love to pray with you and help you understand what it means to be saved and uh, so you can make Jesus the Lord of your life. Will you stand with me, please? We're going to have an invitation, and if you would like to come, and we welcome you for any type of prayer. If you need uh, to talk about something specifically. I know Dad would be happy to pray with you. I would love to myself. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. God, I thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it challenges us and corrects us, Lord. Lord, help us to wait on you. Help us to find moments to be patient and to read your word and to let it change us. To, to all of us to go to a deeper place in our relationship with you. Thank you that you're willing to be with us during those times. Lord, we do pray for those who might not have ever accepted your gift of salvation. Lord, I pray that uh, if someone needs to come, they will, and find that forgiveness. Thank you so much for it, God. And I pray that all of us will find a deeper place of waiting for you and following you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing number 169. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from I'm glad that Brother Mary didn't have a chance uh, to kind of have a little extra time here with Trey, who graduated uh, this, this past year, and uh, that's a wonderful time to get to have together. We want to pray for Meg, who is in Ecuador, and uh, how long will she be there? Awesome. She'll be there a week. Uh, she 
that's on a mission trip there. We're so thankful for that. We also want to remember the Bats family. Miss Deborah's uh, husband, Hank, lost his father. And um, uh, is, did, was the funeral yesterday? Thursday. Thursday. I'm so sorry. The funeral was Thursday. I hope you'll be uh, praying for Mr. Hank. That, or Friday. Me and you both. It's been a long week. <laughs> But we, we need to remember them, and we're so thankful for Miss Deborah and uh, what a light she is around here. She's such a blessing. Well, am I forgetting anything? The quartet will be here on the night, if you did not hear that. Miss Bambi said they're incredible. Excuse me. The pianist is great. Um, also, I printed off. Um, the VBS sign-up sheet. It's at my house if you want to go sign up there. Um, laying in the little tray of the printer. But uh, it will be here soon. But that just be ready. Uh, Y'all are all going to sign up. So I don't even hardly need the sheet. I'll just take your name on the way out. But uh, I love you guys and I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you so much for uh, our family here. And I pray that you will bless us so that we can be a blessing. Lord, thank you for this Memorial Day whenever we can set aside a time to especially remember those who have given so much uh, so that we can have all the things that we do. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.